Hello guys, it is Mighty Miss Malone time. We are going to read chapters 18 and 19 um, as one chapter, as one read aloud today, um, because they are both pretty short. We'll do the comprehension questions, and then tonight I will post um, chapters 20 and 21 because similarly they are short chapters, okay? So without further ado, chapter 18. Deza steers on the last days in Gary. If I ever found that Dewey Decimal System for superstitious sayings and looked up bad news comes in threes, I would have seen that for the Malones, it meant three times every hour. At supper, Jimmy asked what kind of truck we were going to use to move. Mother said, children, give me your hands. A not so good sign. Jimmy, Deza, there isn't going to be a moving truck. We won't need one. My heart flew. Oh, Mother, I knew it. We aren't moving. Yes, Deza, we are. We just won't need a truck to do it. Most of this furniture, she looked around. Who am I kidding? None of this furniture belongs to us. What? I wouldn't have been more surprised if Mother had told me that after 12 years of being on the end of my leg, my left foot belonged to someone else. No, dear, we rent this place furnished. Pretty much all of this belongs to the landlord. I was shocked and mortified. The first thing that came to mind was the wardrobe. That had to be ours. We'd been riding on it for years, and Mother and Father wouldn't tolerate us riding on someone else's furniture. Mother, what about the wardrobe? What about it, Deza? We rode all over it. It has always been a part of our family history. Well, it had been a part of the Malone history for a while, ever since I was two and Jimmy was almost five. On each of our birthdays, we would stand next to the open wardrobe door. We'd stretch our necks as long as they'd go without letting our feet come off the ground. Then mother and father would put a ruler on top of our heads and make a pencil and take a pencil and make a mark to show how tall we were. That way we could keep track of how much we'd grown. All that stopped around the time Jimmy turned 12. I was nine then. After measuring me, father put the ruler on Jimmy's head. It was right at the same mark where it had been the last year. Father looked at Mother and then made a mark that was half an inch taller than Jimmy really was. I almost said, hey, that's not fair, but Mother shot me a look, and I kept quiet. Jimmy was so happy that he had grown even that much. But after a while, when my dress had to be let out, Jimmy was wearing the same clothes month after month. We stopped going to the wardrobe on our birthdays. Yes, Deza, we wrote on it because we thought a million years ago that we were going to buy the furniture from the landlord, but just like with so many other things, life got in the way. Which is just an unpoetic way of saying gang gaffed agly. Mother was so sad that I said, I guess that means we've got a lot less to worry about, right? She smiled. When aren't you right, my mighty Miss Malone? It's only because I've got the blood of the Malones in my veins. You also have the blood of my family, the Sutphins, in there too. Let's not forget that. We looked around at what we'd need to pack. There wasn't going to be much. Mother said, okay, Deza. Mr. Rhymes is going to give us a ride as far as Detroit. I've got three dollars for gas for him. Then another two dollars for bus fare to Flint. Jimmy will be leaving in three days. You've got to say goodbye to your friends. I'd much prefer you write rather than visit in person. Those who are currently in jail. Mother could still make jokes. She told me, Sweetheart, you have permission to walk over to Mrs. Needham's and Claire's to say goodbye. Jimmy, walk with your sister, please. Give them my love, Deza. This was going to be terrible. I was relieved when no one answered Mrs. Needham's door. She was counting on me so much that I knew it would break her heart that I was leaving. But I stayed strong. 
It wasn't until we were walking to Clarice's that I could feel tears swelling up in my eyes. How can you say goodbye to the best friend you've ever had? I reached over and took Jimmy's hand. I knew he wouldn't try to pull away. Come on, sis, don't cry. We gotta get this over with. It's just like when you pulled that tape off my eyebrow. Do it quick. That way it don't hurt so much. Jimmy knocked and Mrs. Johnson answered. Why, Jimmy, Dezza, come on in. Child, what's wrong with you? She pinched my cheek. Jimmy said, bad news, Mrs. Johnson. We gotta move to Michigan and Dezza's come to say goodbye to Clarice. Oh, dear. She wiped up my tears and said, I'm so sorry, Dezza. Did you forget? Clarice and Mr. Johnson and the big boys found some work with Uncle Boo in Nashville. They left an hour ago. I had forgotten all about Clarice telling me this. I'm not expecting him back until Thursday. Can you come then? Jimmy told her, no, ma'am. We're leaving on Wednesday. Secretly? This wasn't such bad news. I knew if I saw how Clarice would take me leaving, it would scar and bruise my soul in a way that wouldn't heal for centuries. Jimmy said, Do you want to write a note or something, Dezza? I tried to talk, but only sobs came out. I nodded my head. Mrs. Johnson said, Hold on one minute, darling. I'll get you a pencil and some paper. Jimmy hugged me hard. She came back. I swear, those children must eat pencils. All I could find was these crayons, Dezza. She handed me an old Prince Albert cigar box full of broken, speckled crayons. She also gave me a piece of blue-lined paper. Mrs. Johnson pulled out a chair at a gigantic table where her family ate. I sat down, took the stub of a black crayon and wrote, my dearest sister, Clarice. My hands started shaking too much, and my eyes started getting too cloudy to write. For me to write a letter telling Cl Clarice a proper goodbye would take years. This letter had to be the best memory Clarice would have. I needed it to be so special that she'd keep it and give it to her great-great-great-grandchildren and tell them, once upon a time in a city named Gary, Indiana, there lived two great and loving friends. My head plopped down on the table. Jimmy put his arms around my shoulders. He took the crayon out of my hand. You want me to write it down for you, sis? I looked up and shook my head. Jimmy said, well, someone's got to write something. What should I say? I just blubbered. He looked over at Mrs. Johnson. I could see where my dear Clarice got her kind and loving nature. Her mother was so close to blubbering, too. Jimmy said, Okay, sis, how about if I just draw something for Clarice? Oh, no, one of Jimmy's drawings. Not that. Could fate be any crueler? Not only was I losing my best friend, but Jimmy wanted one of these, his horrid drawings to be the last thing Clarice heard from me. I had to pull myself together and stop Jimmy from drawing anything, but the heaviness in my heart had swole up into my head, too, and it plopped back down into my arms. Jimmy tugged at the piece of paper I was crying on. Raise up some, sis. Just give me a minute. He started drawing. There. He gave the paper to Mrs. Johnson. She <laughs> looked like she wanted to say something kind about it but just couldn't find the words. I was going to have to translate. I wiped my eyes and blinked at the piece of paper. It was another very bad drawing. Under where I had written my dearest sister Clarice, Jimmy had used the black crayon to draw two frowning girls standing with their arms spread all the way out to their sides. There was a capital D over the left one that was supposed to be me. One second, guys, I apologize. There we go. Yep. Okay. There was a capital C over the girl on the right hand side. <laughs> I 
Look at the picture. My left arm and Clarissa's right were as long as giraffe necks and reached at the center of the page. Each of us held one side of a red dripping blob. Both of us had huge fat drops of water squirting out of our eyes and spraying all over the page. Right in the middle of both, my and Clarissa's stomachs were two big red colored in circles. <laughs> Jimmy printed Deza Steers by the girl who was supposed to be me. There was one arrow coming from those words that pointed at the water Jimmy had drawn coming from my eyes and another arrow that pointed to a half circle near the bottom of the page. Inside the half circle was a spot where the blue lines of the paper had got blurry and looked like a beautiful turquoise puffy cloud floating at the bottom of the page. It was where my real tears had been blurred into the paper's blue lines. I could see that Deza's tears should have been spelled Deza's tears. I pointed at the two big red circles on our stomachs. Jimmy said, it's that corny hand signal you and Clarice give each other about having one heart, and those are two holes where it used to be before it got broken, too. What could I do? I hugged my big brother and choked out. Thank you so much, Jimmy. This is perfect. He smiled. Yeah, I thought so, too. Come on, Deza. We gotta make sure Ma's okay. Which is exactly what you'd expect from the best big brother in the world. Just one more time, seeing his wonderful artwork there. <laughs> Chapter 19, The Malones Meet Marvelous Marvin. Three days before Mr. Rhymes was supposed to give us a ride to Detroit, and it started like so many other days lately, Gang Aftagley. It was far too early in the morning for him to be awake, but Jimmy hollered up the stairs. Ma! Ma! It's the landlord! Mother jerked up in our bed and yelled, Tell him I'll be down in a minute, Jimmy. I did my morning wash up as fast as I could. I heard Mother's raised voice as soon as I got to the stairs. You simply cannot do that. We're paid until the end of the month. That's three more days. Mrs. Malone, what can I say? You've been good tenants. This is just as hard on me as it is on you. But I got kids that like eating too, and I got three families who are going to pay me four times as much to live here as you do. Two of them were ready to move in yesterday. I can't afford to lose them to someone else. My hands are tied. It's nothing personal. You gotta go. Now. No, Mother said. We have rights. The landlord said fine. Go hire a lawyer or call the police, but until I hear something from a shyster or a cop, you're out of here. Fellas, start moving their junk out. The furniture stays. Jimmy yelled, if you touch one thing, I'll gut you like a chicken. Jimmy! Mother screamed. I got to the porch just as Mother pulled a straight razor from Jimmy's hand. Where did you get this? She looked so shocked. I think she'd forgotten all about the landlord and his workers. Jimmy said, a man's got to look after things, Ma. Mother said, since when does carrying a razor make anyone a man? You get inside and you get dressed. Jimmy scowled at the landlord and the three other white men, but he went inside. Mother said to the landlord, give me until noon at least. I have to walk over to a friend's house and see if, I can come pick our if he can come pick our things up. You know we weren't supposed to leave for three days. The landlord said, noon? Only because you've been such good tenants. He got in a truck with the other men, and they drove away. Mother went into the house and came back with her pocketbook and Jimmy. Deza, I don't trust that man. If he comes back early, don't interfere. Just make sure that they don't steal anything. Go in and pack up the rest of your clothes. Strip all the beds and bring everything downstairs. Jimmy, you're coming with me. Jimmy said, what? You're leaving Deza to look after the house to do my job? I don't have time to walk over to Mr. Rhymes' house, get him, and come back and get you out of the hospital or out of jail for attacking somebody. Besides, I need an escort. You know how that sign of town is. Jimmy put his hands up like he was driving the, manipula the manipula mobile. You have a choice. Walk beside me like a gentleman or... Jimmy scowled. 
If Mr. Rhymes is home, we shouldn't be long. She gave me a kiss, and I went back inside. I stripped the beds and put everything in boxes. We had packed most everything else, and our clothes. All that was left was my Sunday school dress, my books, and essays and tests, and Mrs. Needham's niece's dress and shoes. I folded my Sunday school dress and wondered if I could run it over to Clarice's. Maybe if Mr. Rhymes had time, he could drive by that way so I could leave it for her. I left it on my mattress just in case. I took a few of the boxes from Mother's room, and all but the last one I took from mine downstairs. I started looking through my essays to see if there was anything to throw away. Before I knew what happened, I was sitting on the bed reading them. It was pleasant. It was a pleasant way to forget about an unhappy job. I read through one essay and decided I'd make two piles, one for essays and tests that would come with me and one for those that I could leave. I read some others and they all went in this go with me pile. Nothing wrong with that. The next time I looked up, the go with me pile was huge and the other pile was still empty. The screen door slammed. Oh no, Mother and Jimmy, had I been reading that long? I put all the papers, the dictionary and thesaurus, and clothes, and the shoes in the box, and slid it under my bed. I ran downstairs, and my heart near exploded into my throat. A huge, strange white man was in the middle of our living room with a box in his arms. I screamed as loud as I could. The man dropped the box, screamed too, and then flew out of the front door. I ran behind him and slammed and locked the front door. Someone from behind me. What in the Sam Hill? The landlord came out of the kitchen with a mop in his hand. Time's up, girly, unlock that door. I gotta get this cleaned out now. I screamed again. It had scared that first white man. Maybe it would scare this one too. He set the box down and waited patiently for me to breathe. Are you done? He said. Neither of us wants the cops, but I'll call them if I have to. Unlock that door and get out of my way. Your mother asked for until noon, and it's past that. What could I do? I had unlocked the door and went outside. The men had already moved most of our stuff out onto the sidewalk. I'd have to sit and watch to make sure no one was walking by to steal something. Not like there was much to steal. After a while, the landlord put the broom, mop, and two buckets on the sidewalk and said, That's everything. Tell your mother I do feel bad, but business is business. I don't have to do this, but here's something for leaving early. He handed me four $1 bills. I stuffed them in my pocket. I got mouths to feed, too. After he left, a old car stopped in front of the house. A Mexican woman called out of the window. Excuse me, miss, is this 509 Wilbur Place? Yes, ma'am. She said something to the others in the car, and they cheered. A big family got out of the car. It's beautiful. Are you going to be sharing the house with us? Do you need help carrying these in? She pointed at our boxes. No, ma'am. We're moving out. Oh, I hope your next home is as beautiful as this one. Thank you, ma'am. I hope so, too, I said. Ma'am, do you mind if I sit on the step until my mother comes back? She's getting a car so we can load our boxes. Please, she said, holding my screen door open. You can come in to wait if you want. This family seemed like they were good of character, but I couldn't stand to see them living in my home. Thank you, ma'am, but I have to watch our things, she said. Rosario, can you Rosario can keep you company. Maybe you can tell her about the neighborhood and school and any nice little girl she can be friends with. A girl a little younger than me said, Hello. Hi. We sat next to each other, but neither of us felt like talking. Her family was inside screaming and yelling as they went from room to room. You would have thought that they'd found gold nuggets. Every time they yelped, the girl would look back towards the front door and then back at me. She had the most beautiful, sorrow-filled black eyes 
and eyelashes that were as thick and black as the teeth of a comb. I told her, you can go in if you want. I'm fine out here. She said, really? Sure. Thank you. She jumped up to the front door. I said, be careful if you let it go. The screen bangs loud and disturbs people. Okay. She seemed like a sweet person. So I said, if you look under the welcome mat, there's a little knot hole in the porch that my brother and his friends used to shoot marbles into. If you can figure out a way to get underneath the porch, there must be a million of them down there. Jimmy and his friends think that the marbles fell all the way to China, which is geologically exactly on the other side of the earth from Gary. But that's nonsense. They're still under that porch. She laughed and said, Dios mio, all brothers are idiotas. Muchas gracias. Another whole family walked up and moved into our house. And still, no mother and Jimmy. I looked in one of the boxes and found the kitchen clock. 2.28. I knew it would make time stand still, but I set the clock next to me. At 3.30, Mother trudged up the sidewalk, looking like she'd walked a hundred miles. Mother, where have you been? I'm so sorry, Desa. Let me sit for a second. She sat next to me on the step. We waited at the Rimes' house for hours. When they came back, we found out that Mr. Rimes had lost his car. The bank took it back. Where's Jimmy? I sent him to the post office to have any mail we get forwarded to the general delivery in Flint. To what? General delivery, since we're not sure what our address in Flint's going to be, any mail we get in Gary will go to Flint. We'll have to go to the post office there and pick it up. That made this whole moving to Flint story seem a lot realer and a lot sadder. Mother picked up the clock. Goodness, it's that late? Jimmy said he might not come straight home, that he knew someone who could help us. I was too tired to fight him. There are people living in our house. She looked at the front door. I'm so sorry, Deza. Don't worry. We'll... A long, shiny black car stopped in front of our house. My smiling brother and a man jumped out. Ma, Deza, this is Marvin. He can carry our stuff to his girlfriend's house, and for five bucks we can stay there for a week. Mother and me looked at Marvin. His skinny, skinny mustache matched the rest of him. He was dressed in a fancy suit that had such sharp creases in the trousers that if you brushed against them, they'd cut you like a razor. His shoes and hat were ex the exact same color as the suit, and so clean that he looked like a movie star. A hunk of gold on his finger sparkled like the sun. When he took off his hat and tipped it at us, his hair was jet black slicked and wavy. He said, marvelous, absolutely marvelous to make your acquaintance, young ladies. Mother looked at him for the longest time before she said, hello, Jimmy, can I talk to you for a minute, please? Sure, Ma, give me a minute, Marv. Cool. Mother and Jimmy and me walked to the side of the house. Mother said, James Edward Malone? Isn't that the man they call Marvelous Marvin Ware? Yeah, isn't it great he's going to help? Mother snapped. Isn't he the numbers man? Yes, Ma. She slapped the back of Jimmy's head. How on earth do you know him? Ow, Ma. He's heard me singing in the park. He's always liked my voice. The numbers man? Yes, Ma. He's so you're riding in a car with the numbers man. I said, Mother. What's the numbers, man? Jimmy knows exactly who he is. He steals poor people's pennies with a gambling scheme, Jimmy said, and he's the best, always pays off. He's the honestest numbers man in Gary. Mother looked at the pile of boxes on the sidewalk, sighed, and reached into her pocketbook. She counted out five $1 bills and gave them to Jimmy. Any port in a storm. Me and Mother sat in the back of the car. Jimmy and Marvelous Marvin loaded all of our things in what Jimmy called the trunk. Wasn't like any truck I'd ever seen. 
It was really only a door that raised up in the back of the car. The trunk door slammed shut, and both me and Ma jumped. I had never been inside an automobile except for Mr. Steel Lung's truck, but this car, this car was amazing. The seats were made of a brown cloth, more beautiful and softer than anything I'd ever seen. There was a brown carpet on the floor and more of the brown material on the ceiling of the car. This automobile was the kind of place that you felt like you could swipe your feet two or three times or even take your shoes off before you got into it. There was even a radio. The middle of the steering wheel spelled out B-U-I-C-K. I'd, I'd have to ask Jimmy how to pronounce it later. Buick. I looked at Mother to see if she was as excited and amazed as me, but she'd crossed her arms and was staring sadly out of the window at our old house. I did the same. Jimmy and the numbers man got in the car and Marvelous Marvin said to Mother, I know you must be very proud of little Jimmy here, Miss Malone. Mother never looked away from the window. It's Mrs. Malone. Sorry, ma'am, but I ain't never heard no one, kid, grown man, or otherwise, who can sing like him. Yeah, the little man's marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Jimmy stretched and looked over the back of the front seat at us, his eyebrows jumping up and down. He could see that Mother wasn't impressed, and I was giving him my angriest look. He turned around. Marvelous Marvin said, y'all mind if I fire up a square? Jimmy translated, is it okay with you if he smokes, Ma? Me and Mother said, no! Cool. Yeah, Jimmy said, that's cool. We stayed quiet for most of the ride. But my goodness, what a ride. Mr. Steel Lung's truck was nothing but bump after bump. This car was like a magic carpet. We'd floated all the way through Gary, heading west. We drove further and further. Jimmy laughed. Do you see that, Deza? I looked at Mother, but she was staring out the window, lost. What? Those signs on the side of the road. There must be five of them in a row. They got poems on them. Poems? Jimmy said, yeah, poems. Nothing like the ones Pa makes up, but at least these rhyme. Look, there's more of them coming up. Marvelous Marvin said, oh yeah, them's Burma shave signs. That's what I use to keep my skin soft as a baby's behind. He rubbed his hand over his chin. I, it looked like he was wearing nail polish. I told him, I don't think I'd like to be compared to anybody's behind. Mother slapped my hand. That's a hush, Jimmy said. Here comes one. It was a skinny red sign on a post at the side of the road. Jimmy read, when driving the roads, the next sign was a bit further along. Keep your hands in the car then, or it may end up, next, in some doctor's jar. Me and Jimmy and Marvelous Marvin shouted the last sign out, Burma shave! We burst out laughing, except for Mother. Jimmy read the next signs. He chose not to shave with our famous brand. That's why he's known as the loneliest man. Everyone but Mother shouted, Burma shave! Before long, Jimmy said, Dang, Marv, where's this house at? Marvin said, Chi Town, baby. Mother said, Chicago? Yes, ma'am. We got another 10, maybe 15 minutes. This gal's from Gary, but she wanted to stay near her mama in Chi Town. She shares a place with her sister, who's out of town for a while, so I convinced her to put y'all up till then. Mother shook her head and looked back out the window. We stopped in front of a house. That was just as nice as the automobile. The numbers man said, home again, home again, jiggity jig. On the front porch, Mr. Marvelous knocked. The door opened and a soft, sweet smell whooshed out. All right, guys. Comprehension questions for chapters 18 and 19, and then I will see you tonight at 5 o'clock for chapters 20 and 21. Question 1 for chapters 18 and 19. What were the Malones going to use their, to move their belongings? A moving truck, their arms, a friend's truck, or horses? Number 2. 
why wasn't the furniture coming with the Malones when they moved? A. It was all broken. B. They were going to buy all new furniture. C. It wasn't theirs, it was rented. Or D. They had no house to put it in. Number three, why would, mother's mar why would mother mark a half inch taller on the wardrobe for Jimmy? Remember that time where he hadn't grown at all? Was it because A, he wasn't growing and it made him feel better? B, he was taller than the cabinet? C, he hated looking at all of the marks? D, he was so short he couldn't even reach the top and Deza could? Number four, what happened when Deza knocked on Mrs. Needham's door? A. Nobody answered. B. Mrs. Needham answered and cried at the news. C. Mrs. Needham's niece demanded the clothing back. Or D. Deza didn't even knock on the door. Number five. Where was Clarice and Deza when... Oh, I'm sorry. Where was Clarice when Deza went to say goodbye? A. Chicago. B. St. Louis. C. Nashville. Or D. Louisiana. Number six, what note did Deza leave Clarice? A, a picture that Jimmy drew. B, a long letter. C, nothing. Or D, a heart necklace. Number seven, why couldn't Mr. Rhymes give the Malones a ride? A, he was afraid he'd get in trouble. B, his car was taken away by the bank. C, he was sick. D. He moved away. 8. Why did the landlord kick the Malones out early? A. He had people who would pay more to live there. B. The Malones were awful tenants. A tenant is someone who rents a place, by the way. I should have said that earlier. I'm sorry. C. He was selling the house. Or D. He thought they were gone already. 9. Who did Jimmy get to help out? A. Mrs. Needham, B. Dr. Bracey, C. Marvin Ware, or D. Albert Einstein. And lastly, 10. What city are the, Malo the Malones going to stay in? So at the end of this chapter, are they staying in A. Lansing, B. Chicago, C. Melville, or D. Detroit? I'll see you guys at 5. Bye! Get outside. Go play. It's beautiful out.